Heidi Lee. It's the small things. It's the small things. Heidi Lee. Look at me. Come on, look at me. You can't tell, but I'm four feet, 13 inches tall. I know I'm small, but the funny thing is, I have never felt small. After all, when I... When I compare myself with a mosquito, I know that I'm a giant. <sighs> Madame Contest Chair and fellow giant, have you heard of the expression tiger mom? It is a mom who expects giant achievement from her children. A straight A at school, a black belt in karate, a Picasso wannabe. Tiger mom wants it all, intellectual, physical, and artistic. I have no idea where my mom comes from. She's totally different. Maybe it is from her Buddhist mentality. Growing up, mom, that's how I call her. Mom said to me, Heidi, you have no need to be the best because it will only bring you lots of stress and anxiety. But you don't want to be the worst either. Not too good that people will envy you and not too bad that people look down on you. <sighs> Can you believe that she actually said that to me? She told me being a small person will bring me happiness. She never expect me to be a lawyer or a doctor. She said, Heidi, as long as you're not doing anything criminal, you're okay. What? Such a low expectation and so easy to achieve. Looking back, maybe it is a mother's love. Who doesn't want the children to be successful? But she didn't want to put that pressure on me. And because of that, I was able to excel on my own terms. And you know what? I fell in love with challenges and personal improvement. And with that small expectation, really made me want to go big. That small expectation actually prepares me to become a giant. Growing up with this Buddhist mom, I think I'm doing okay because I didn't do anything criminal. I didn't become a lawyer or a doctor. I became a fashion designer. One Mother's Day, I decided to make her a dress. I gave her a choice of styles, fabrics, and colors. She chose a shimmering silk in a platinum color. And with that, I made her a beautiful dress. The day came, she opened the box with anticipation. She took a deep breath as she stared at the dress. And then her hands started to shake. And then there was a smile on her face. Not a word was spoken, but I saw a sense of pride in her eyes. At that moment, the world seem to freeze on us. I didn't know who is going to cry first. To her, that was an awesome gift from her daughter because she knew that it was made with love. As years went by, I noticed that she would only wear the dress at special occasions. At my brother's wedding, at her 50th wedding anniversary, and, oh my gosh, I am so sure that she's going to wear that dress again at the grand opening of a brand new McDonald's. And each time, she will remind everyone that her dress was custom made by me. 
she was so proud of it. She paraded it around like it was the best dress on the red carpet. I am so glad that she liked it, but I didn't think much of it. I was too busy building my fashion career. I even relocated to the United States from Canada, far away from her. Thinking that dress was put away for good. Eight years ago, at her funeral, I walked towards the casket to give her one last kiss. I could not believe my eyes. She was wearing the dress that I made for her. I have to ask my sister, why is she wearing my dress? And she said, yes, Heidi. Mom's last request was, bury me in Heidi's dress. That small gift that I gave her meant so much to her that she took it with her to her grave. She paid me the highest compliment by wearing that dress on her last special occasions. To her, that small gift is giant. And in her eyes, I am the giant. My fellow giant, what I learned from my mother, don't put stress on yourself. Set goals that is achievable and do them very well. And in the process of doing it, you become a giant. Dalai Lama once said, if you think that you're too small to make a difference, try. Try sleeping with a mosquito. Madame Pontel. Carlos Calderon, who are you? Who are you, Carlos Calderon? Madam Contest Master, friends, what do a yoga instructor and a sweet grandmother have in common? The answer coming right after this message. So there I was in yoga class, and the instructor gave us a mantra to repeat, I am. And as the minutes ticked on, we all repeated to ourselves, I am, I am, I am. Then the class ended and everyone headed home. As I got into my car, I was a little bit confused. You see, the instructor never gave me the answer. I am. I'm what? I'm who? Who am I? I was lost. And my lost thoughts found their way to distant memories of my grandmother. My grandmother took care of me when I was a little boy. And boy, did I need care. I was a confused child. In school, I'd see the other kids and I felt like I didn't belong. I didn't think like them, didn't speak like them. Frankly, I wasn't like them, but I wanted to be just like them. And that caused me to feel confused, lost, and invisible. But then I'd see my grandma and she was always fun because she was always teaching me new things, giving me messages that made me think. Like for example, she taught me the importance of fresh ingredients in cooking. She'd say, Carlos, always fresh, never frozen. And then we'd watch her favorite TV show, and she'd point to the screen and say, be careful with men with beards. Even if they pretend to be good, 
in the end, they're bad. My grandma was always telling me things that, that pushed my thought process, messages that made me think. But then the years went by and she got sick. She developed dementia. She'd forget things. And I remember visiting her in the hospital. I went up to her and I'm like, hi, grandma, it's me. And she looked at me with a frail voice, she asked, who are you? I was taken aback. After all the time we had spent together, I wasn't expecting that. And I didn't know how to deal with that. So I left the room. And that's the last time I ever saw her alive. A few days later, she passed. And there were times after that that I dreamed that she was still alive and her mind was clear. And we would talk and she'd give me one more message, one more nugget of knowledge. But no, she's gone. And then my thoughts, returned back to the drive home of the yoga studio. I am. Who are you? Then it hit me. Could my grandmother have had one more message for me? Could it be the same one as the yoga instructor? Yes, the message was clear. I had to define myself. No one else should. For too long, I looked to others to tell me who I should be and how I should act. Classmates, my grandmother, yoga instructor, no more. How could I expect others to see me as anything if I didn't know who I am? I would continue to be lost unless I found myself. And I found myself in the person I want to be, the person I want others to see me as. For example, I want people to see me as a good attorney. So I act like a good attorney. I want people to see me as a good husband. So I am a good husband. I want people to see me as a very good looking guy. Well, two out of three is not bad. Have you ever felt like you're being judged? Like you're living someone else's life? living based on someone else's rules. Too often we look for the answers of how we should be out there on social media when the answers have always been here and here. So I challenge all of us, let's stop living the failures of others from the past and let's start living for the success of our future. Find yourself, believe in yourself, be yourself. Be a good person, even if you have a beard. So as the days go by, consider this question. Who are you? Contest message. Daryl Pace, show mo toe. Show mo toe, Daryl Pace. 
Shomoto, Shomoto, Shomoto. Summer, 1976, I was 10 years old, shy, in sports camp and afraid I'd bomb in front of everybody. Contest chair full of Toastmasters and honored guests. By day three, I'd bombed in baseball, basketball, and golf. The coach ended the day saying, boys, tomorrow, it's swim day. I thought, cool. I'm a YMCA youth swimming program minnow, which means I can swim 25 yards without a flotation device. It also means I'm going to show the boys at camp how swimming is done. The next day, swim time, as I strode toward my liquid victory. A camp kid came up. Your toe, it's stretched. Have you ever been confused by some news? The next kid, who was attracted by the shadow of the first, ran up and made it clear. Your toe, it's huge. His shout attracted more kids. Their shouts attracted others until my feet were like a museum exhibit of a large alien corpse. Shouts of huge toe freak rang through the pool yard. And right then, my self-esteem was cracked, shifted, altered permanently. I had no liquid victory. Instead, I had new knowledge that my big toes were really, really big. And an open wound to my self-esteem that bled a question. What would people think of my toes and me? Have you ever had a fear that held you back? How did you handle it? I ran from mine. And it caused me to miss out. Pool parties, no. Barefoot walks on the beach, don't even think about it. Open-toed sandals, only with socks on. These toes, like Bigfoot, stayed hidden. But there were rumors of their existence and occasional sightings. Like when my nieces and nephews asked me to jump on the trampoline with them. Uh, but it wasn't on. really. I took mine off. My 12-year-old nephew, William, approached. Hey, uh, Uncle Daryl. Yeah. That's a big, big toe you got there, Uncle Daryl. I mean, seriously, that's a circus toe. I ran from the fear of what others would think of my toes for over 40 years. Then, in the midst of my midlife crisis, I asked myself the big question. What am I going to do? about these toes. And I thought about a time I was a teenager after another toe sighting complaining to my mom. Mom, I hate these gigantic toes. She said, Daryl, those are great toes. They're a sign you're meant to be a leader. As a teenager, I thought, yeah, right. But as I reflected on that as an adult, I recognized how my mom was trying to reframe my thinking. And it was like she was speaking to me again saying, forget trying to change what others think about you and focus on changing what you think about yourself. And I started to see these toes differently, not as a curse, but as a challenge I had to overcome to be more the person I wanted to be. I decided I'd face that challenge. How? I'd show my toes. I started small around the house, then with my daughter at the playground and on family vacation, these toes were on full display and I felt the fear subside. But to squash it fully, I needed to show more toe. So I decided to take the ultimate step. I signed up for a pedicure. Just thinking about it terrified me. I asked my wife, Teresa, for support, honey, Will you come with me to get a pedicure? <gasps> Absolutely, Daryl. I love pedicures. 
You think they've ever seen toes like these? Daryl, I'm certain they've seen all kinds of feet. She paused. When we go in, can we act like we don't know each other? But it was full speed ahead. We went to the salon, and yes, the pedicures took my foot and had some initial toe shock. But I didn't care. We got that pedicure done. It was awesome, and I felt victorious. I'd overcome a fear I'd had since childhood, and I thank my mom for giving me a fear-busting strategy that's made me so bold that now I go to the beach in my thong. Toad sandals. And I don't wear socks. It's the show mo toe strategy. And by the way, I say show mo instead of show more because I think that sounds mo catchy. Show mo toe means reframing your mind about yourself and the fear, then repeatedly facing it until you crush it. Reframe, face your fear, crush it. That's show mo toe. Now, when I'm feeling fearful or I'm in a pressure situation and want to put my best foot forward, I repeat to myself, show mo toe, show mo toe, show mo toe. Has anyone ever said something to you that caused you to doubt yourself? Have you ever said something to you that caused you to doubt yourself? My mom taught me that you, I, and everyone have fears and insecurities. But do you have one that holds you back from being all you want to be? Put another way, do you have a big toe? If so, show moto. Contest chair. <laughs>